Hi, everybody. This is James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, Vid Dog Training, and I am broadcasting this vlog tonight live from my new laptop. So I hope everything's good. The uh, picture looks great. I'm looking at myself. The uh, picture looks good. Uh, the lighting is great. I've got myself an LED light um, that supposed to be better daylight light i'm not really sure what that means but it apparently makes me look as if i'm not in the shadow anymore so i'm pretty happy about that um so i apologize for not being able to do my vlog on monday i just got super swamped and just dealing with a whole bunch of things and uh, if i don't catch up to my admin stuff i end up falling behind and i'm probably like three to four days behind on my emails as well so it's um it's a bit of a bit of a struggle. I'm just trying to catch up here on my cell phone as well, just to see where I need to um, um, make sure that I can see comments coming in because it doesn't show up on my on my Facebook itself. So, um, and then I have this other little screen thing. But uh, hey, welcome! Thank you so much. I'm glad you can see me, you can hear me. And as I start working towards uh, doing my podcast itself, I've got my video camera. I have. I'm waiting. I actually ordered a lighting kit. Uh, that's coming in, so I'm waiting for that to show up from uh, Amazon. Love hate relationship with Amazon, so I'll have that, and then I will. Um, uh, I've got a cable coming in that's going to allow me to do a live feed from my camera direct to the laptop. Then I can do uh, even better quality. Right now, this is pretty good quality. I mean, I'm just like wow, I'm I'm pretty amazed. Before I felt like I was in a shadow, uh, but again, so I want to apologize for not being able to do my vlog. On Monday, I just knew I had to catch up with everything else that was uh, a priority. But I did do a post up of what I was or wanted, should I say, wanted to talk about. And I actually talked to my friend, Shannon Emanuel, and she is this phenomenal uh, artist. She paints uh, just phenomenal paintings. And I've actually posted a couple of things. Hers, uh, her her uh, pages, Daydream, uh, Daydreamer uh, Art Illustrations. And it's incredible. She, uh, I hope I got that right, uh, Shana, uh, Shannon. Um, it, she did one of, uh, of uh, my beloved Nero who passed away in June and also of Walter and these are just phenomenal uh, just incredible how she captured uh, the essence and the life of uh, these uh, two dogs and then just really brought in incredible things and, and it was actually something that uh, Shannon did as a, as a fundraiser for my rescue foundation uh, it was a super surprise when I saw the one of Walter and then I asked her if she would do one for Nero um, and this was back at a time when Nero was, um, was um, uh, you know, a, a, a few months before Nero, my, my beloved Nero, passed away. Uh, and Sue says, hi, James, going crazy here also. Yeah, I can imagine you with your, uh, with your husband um, working with his through his things, as well as just you trying to take care of Momo and all the other uh, dogs that you have. Uh, and, oh, yeah, and her paintings are beautiful, Sue says, and that's absolutely incredible it's it's totally amazing i love artists it doesn't matter what kind of art you breathe it does not matter if you write if you create if you don't even think you're a great artist i i'm i know i'm not i couldn't do anything as close to what shannon does uh for for, for that art is an amazing thing same with actors right as a lot of you know that i used to act when i was younger um art is this an amazing expression of our soul and whether or not you believe in god does not matter it's the soul that essence inside of us, that organic existence inside of us that allows us to breathe, allows us to express, allows us to, to follow our dreams, whether or not they're realized or not, but it allows us to have that fantasy and that growth inside of us to understand of things that we can achieve. For me, what I'm doing here with dog training, uh, um, I had a few people ask me actually in the last few days is how did I get into it? And as I've said before in previous vlogs, it just happened to it where I just got into it and I started working with dangerous dogs right off the bat. I didn't have any professional or informal dog training, anything whatsoever. I just thought, well, you know, I'm going to adopt a dog, a Great Dane, um, after my divorce. And it turned out to be that it was a, a Great Dane that was 154 pounds, my beloved Lincoln Chai. Uh, my first great day and he was reactive he was lunging at people he was doing a lot of really bad things and a lot of people would, like I'd, I'd walk with them and people would like they'd be saying you know f and this f and that you should kill your dog and like they would just say like people say some of the most ignorant things to people with dysfunctional and reactive dogs and so people would be yelling at that and they'd be crossing the street and uh, it was really quite embarrassing and I had to figure out a way how to relax and to calm down because I was really scared myself with my own dog with Lincoln going, I don't know what he's doing and he's a big dog. 
And then I finally figured out that I should just start talking to him. And one of the um, uh, people who helped guide me right from day one, which was Elaine Dixon, who is the founder of New Hope for Danes. It is North America's oldest Great Dane Rescue. Uh, they were established, uh, uh, not sorry, not North America, Canada's oldest Great Dane Rescue, established in 1984. And, they, and she has saved over 5,000 Great Danes and mixes. And uh, Elaine just basically said to me, hey, James, you got a gift. You should follow it through. I said, no, I don't. Um, but long, long, long road, long story. Uh, here I am, um, about five years later. I was doing it unprof- uh, not professionally, should I say. I was doing it uh, for free for other rescue organizations because um, I had my own business at the time. I was working with other people's dogs, other rescue dogs for free, usually big dogs, dogs that would attack Lincoln. They would attack me. Um, and then I'd be alone with them and I'd be like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And then, um, um, and then I would end up uh, working with um, uh, other Great Danes and then other breeds of dogs. And Sarah Dogs, uh, which brings in dogs from Taiwan, they asked me for help. And I did for uh, their dog, uh, first dog, Melody, in a week and a half, what they couldn't do with their trainers um, for several months. And they spent a lot of money with those guys. I think they spent $1,500. And I did it for free because I'm fostering. And I worked with Melody and I had her off leash. I had recall with her. Uh, and she hated men because men beat her, and that's what was one of the issues. She would be what they called a fear biter, and she would have other types of issues, and so she would then uh, be reactive, and she, they said she has no recall, and, and you couldn't pet her, and a whole bunch of really tough things, and I saw videos where she was in a kennel, uh, in a cage, right, in a crate, in a kennel, and she wouldn't come out, and uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the facility, which was over on the island, instead of um, just dumping the kennel sideways and just letting Melody slide out, they actually took a catch pole, snared her inside the kennel, and then yanked her out. And you can imagine what that would do. So it didn't make sense, but they caused a lot more issues for Melody. Uh, She was actually seized by the SPCA on the island uh, after neighbors saw her being beaten by her owner Uh, at about eight months of age, and then they seized her, returned her back to the rescue, and then they sought a few other places. Nobody could help Melody. They asked me, well, they asked Elaine Dixon. Elaine Dixon said, oh, go ask James. And James, that's me. I'm like, I don't, I I can foster her, but I don't know if I can help her. I don't know anything. But I just trusted the connection that I had with Melody, just as if, uh, as the same as I had trusted my connection with Lincoln. And people who saw Lincoln a year later said, uh, and these are people who knew Lincoln when he was with his previous family. And they said, oh, we can't believe the change. We can't believe he's the same dog. But it was just more that I just started conversing with Lincoln, started having conversations and having uh, relevant conversations without extraneous words. I was talking to Lincoln with only what was necessary to talk to him, but with the full breath and the full emotionality of that. So if I would say things like, hi, Lincoln, hi, Lincoln, hi, Lincoln. Hi, Lincoln. All these different tones and all that stuff. And you know how when your mom calls out your name when you're a kid and, you know, just when she takes that first, like, you're like, oh, oh I'm in trouble. You can tell right away. So that's what we do with the the uh, the, the uh, intonation, the, the, the rhythm of how we talk to dogs. And that's our conversation. And I've had a few trolls. If you go to my YouTube page, you're going to see all these people are trolling me on one of my live uh, uh, dog group training uh broadcast and they're making fun of me and all that stuff and and they're trying to say you know what because i said food doesn't exist in the canine species which is true food doesn't exist in the canine species as a communication tool much less a reward fiat and so i my position is and i can prove this 100 percent of the time is that food does not help a dog with dysfunctions and anybody with a dysfunctional dog knows that when your dog gets really amped up you can throw uh, the, the juiciest steak you could throw them <laughs> 15 squirrels in front of them and your dog is going to go after the target, either a human or an animal or a dog. I mean, sorry, another dog. They don't care. They're just going to go for that target that they're fixated on. They don't care about the baby squirrels. They don't care about the, the, the steak. They want that target. And so how do I address these things is having that conversation with my dogs. Every single dog that I work with, I'm always having conversation. I'm doing it without medication, without treats. I have 100%, 100% success rate across the board from the most mildest, um, small OCD issues, pawing at the ground, anxiety issues, just the mild little issues that people think that it's beneath, uh, you know, my scale. It isn't. 
just so you know, it's, it's relevant. It's important to your dog. It's important to other people. It's important to not just your dog, but yourselves as well as the humans, as the parents. So I've worked with dogs that are mild issues up to dogs that are extremely dangerous. Predatorial, you've seen the media uh, uh, stuff on me, the newspaper articles and everything like that, working with the most extremely dangerous Great Dane in North America in 2016 and 2017, weighing 180 plus pounds having attacked 16 people, dragged a shelter working to his kennel. It was beaten so badly, he's partially blind, 20% blind, 10% hearing loss, slight brain damage. Right then and there, those medical issues right then and there, having a dog that's reactive is already dangerous. Having a 183-pound dog that's that dangerous and partially blind and deaf, partially deaf and slight brain damage is enough to just anybody, well, that's actually every trainer and behaviorist in North America said, we're not going to work with this dog. He's too dangerous. He's going to kill me or he's going to kill one of my staff. We had, uh, they had people who would say, well, yeah, we'll board and train him. Uh, but then we're going to need him muzzled. And then what do we do after his muzzle is off so he can eat? How do we get the muzzle back on him? No, we're not going to take that risk. I took, uh, I took him in. His name was Tonka at the time. I took Tonka in, worked with him. And I will tell you, it's extremely scary. The first time I met him, the first couple of hours I met Tonka was in the hotel room in Seattle of his handler, who's a retired police officer with an NYPD, all, uh, New York Police Department, and also an ex-military <laughs> vet. Uh, so this is a person who knows what they're doing. And um, they couldn't even handle Tonka over a year of working with him at the Southampton Animal Shelter. Southampton's, they got deep, deep pockets. You know, that's Howard Stern money. That's $50 million house that uh, Howard Stern owns over in Southampton's. They've got lots and lots of money. They were willing to pay and do whatever they could to get Tonka help. Every single person said the money's not worth being killed over him. It's too dangerous. I did take Tonka knowing what he was going to be like. And uh, for a lot of you people, who are working with your dogs, who have worked with me, I always say, if you have a problem, actually any kind of training, if you have a problem, go back to step one. Go back to the first step ever. Go back to the basics. Start from square one and work your way back up again. Don't think that your dog has fallen back or regressed. Your dog hasn't regressed. Your dog hasn't fallen back. Your dog has hit a plateau, a flat spot. Anybody who's worked out bodybuilding, in the gym, you know when you hit a plateau, right? You know you can't get advanced anymore, but you're at this level. That's where your dog is. When you feel like they're regressing, you get great inroads, and then all of a sudden your dog starts reacting again. It's not your dog regressing. It is your dog hitting a plateau. When you hit a plateau, go back to square one. I've gone back to square one so many times with the same dog over months, sometimes over a year, two years, and it still happens. If I'm not paying attention to them, then they will react because they see me shirking my responsibilities as their parent of supervision and making sure that I'm watching what they're doing and keeping them safe. And if they find they're not safe, if they find they're not being supervised, if they find that there is a slight weakness in the consistency of the family structure, your dog, my dog, predacious as they are, they're predators, they're going to look for that and they're going to take advantage of it. They're going to capitalize on it because it's their natural behavior. So it's not something that we can go and blame our dog and say, you know what, the dog, blah, blah. It's just us screwing up and slacking off and our dog finding out there's a weakness. I'm going to take advantage of that. And they're not trying to dominate us. They're basically trying to place themselves in a position where they feel that they're best suited at. And that's why some dogs become much more uh, um, confident in what we people call aggressive or whatever. It's just more of the confidence that the dog has in regards to how they are in that position. It can be an insecurity, a whole bunch of other issues, but it's the confidence of the dog to be able to move forward and take advantage of those opportunities that are presented. Just like a good salesperson, if they see certain things that we are talking about, they'll be like, oh, are you sure? Maybe you need this and this because I can hear you talking about it. It's the same thing with salespeople, same thing with our dogs. Just so smart. Salespeople, a good salesperson, phenomenally brilliant. These people are incredible talkers. They make you feel at ease. They know what to look for. They know what to listen to. Your dog is doing this at one-tenth of a second. They're listening to everything that we're saying. 
They're watching the way we present ourselves, they're watching our body language, the way we walk, our gait, any nuances, any shifts in the way we walk or talk. Um, so the biggest thing for me is always maintaining that connection with my dogs by talking to them. And um, I'm going to go over what I wrote down over last uh, on, on Monday night, which was conversations with our dog is important. And I'm just going to read off what I said there is that conversation is very important with our dogs. Uh, I mean, I, I teach my dogs uh, and owners and their dogs how to converse, not talk to their dogs, um, but have a real conversation with them. And nothing that's extraneous, not extraneous words. And I maintain a contextual relationship uh, with my dogs. So all my language that I'm talking to my dog has to be relevant to what my dog needs to understand. I don't go and say, no, don't do that. You're not doing that. That's a really bad thing. You're gonna, but I just say, stop or no. You can use words such as leave it. And if you notice this, a lot of people out there are using the words leave it to have a dog that has something in their mouth that they've taken to drop it, right? So it's either drop it or leave it. But a lot of people say leave it. And if you think about those two words, leave it, that's about as human as you can get in natural conversation. We talk to our children, leave it, leave it alone, leave them alone, stop bugging them, leave it, leave it, leave it. We don't say drop it. Well, sometimes we'll say to the our, our, uh, to a kid, you know, they got something in their mouth, drop it, you're going to choke to death. So we will always have a conversation with our dogs. And naturally, for those of you who naturally use the words, leave it, that's your intuition. That's you having a conversation with your dog. That's you saying just enough to your dog so that they understand it. Because you're not saying leave it alone and don't touch it again and put it down and blah, blah, blah. You're like, leave it. And your dog's like, okay. That's all they need to understand. It's just the, the, the relevant words. Um, let me, I'm just going to kind of read back here. I just missed some comments here. Uh, Casey uh, said, hey, James, nice to see you. Archer is getting big. He's getting bigger and definitely still a little bit aggressive over his treats. I've just been continuously petting him when he has treats, taking, uh, taking them away and giving them back. It's impossible to get food back if he takes it, though. Just working on prevention with the food. If there's no food to take, then there's no problem. And Casey had, uh, uh, from what I recall, Casey has a great Pyrenees um, and an eighth, an eighth Mastiff or something. Casey, I can't remember. This is like a week and a half ago, right? Um, that uh, you posted, um, and and her dog Archer would be right. This is right, Casey. I think right. Uh, uh, Archer would be grabbing food off the counter when, when Casey would leave or just walk away from her or something drop, he'd grab it. And so she was trying to get it away from him all the time. And he would kind of growl at her and became a bit more uh, concerning because of course, when you have a dog that's 80, 90, 100, 150 pounds or even 20 pounds, when they're growling, we get afraid. It's normal. If we're, I mean, we're out in the woods and we're confronted by a bear or a wolf and the bear is growling at us. It would be like, uh scary okay uh quarter antonian shepherd is uh casey's corrected me uh as well so seven eights great pyrenees and all that and i think he's like three months four, three and a half right 12 weeks 13 weeks old now 14 weeks probably and so casey has been working with archer just through um getting him used to her taking things away not creating an urgency i know there was somebody else um uh, a former police uh, dog trainer who'd also contact me, right? I was talking about that in that vlog as well at the same time, Casey, who she was trying to work with her dog as well in regards to um, him taking, um, yeah, him taking food from her as well. So we just want to be able to be safe when we're working with big dogs because I think uh, this, the, the trainer, uh, the police trainer, uh, police dog trainer's dog uh, was with a, uh, I think it was a pound of butter or something that they, 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 that, that they stole. And I, and I think when you went to grab it back, he, he grabbed or she grabbed your arm and just mouthed it and held it in her mouth for a bit, which is very scary to begin with. Cause it's, you know, it's, it's not just like a little, uh, you know, a, a Labrador, you know, a smaller dog, but when you have an Antolian shepherd or you're having a, um, a great Pyrenees or a great Dane or a Mastiff have their hand they have their arm around you it's not just like this this is not this is this, my hands like a baby hat they're, they're like this they're, they're all over it and it can be quite scary to do so and one of the things i said to the uh, uh, ex-police dog trainer is that you've got to be calm you got to fake it you got to pretend you're not scared and casey uh you guys know what it's like to be scared 
poopless to be so scared because you're like, what do I do? Because my dog is going to attack me. And then we kind of fake it. We have to. We have to fake it. We have to fake it with the voice and pretend that we're not scared. And our dog is like, okay, something's going on. But my owner's not, my human's not acting crazy like they did before. They seem to be more in control. We want to instill that type of confidence. And we do it by our language, by how we talk to our dogs. Uh, when I start doing my podcast, which I'm going to try to do next week, I'm going to try to do one podcast next week to, to set it up and vlog it out. Um, I'm going to start talking about the most key part that I learned was conversation. And when I started talking to dogs, uh, to my dog, Lincoln and all that, I was like, blah, 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 like I am now. But then I learned to use only what was necessary at that time so that he would learn that my, uh, my Lincoln would learn what I was saying to him because I didn't talk and say different words. You know how a lot of times people do a recall command and they'll say, uh, Zevia, come. And then as Zevia's coming, like, come, Zevia, come, Zevia, come, come. And Zevia's coming. She's like, You're, why are you repeating the command again? Oh, wait, maybe that's, maybe I'm not supposed to come along. Maybe I'm, maybe you're repeating it, which means I am not following the correct command if you're repeating it, right? So we want to make sure we're not repeating ourselves. We want to make sure we're not saying extraneous words as well, because your dog is paying attention to what we're saying. When they want to communicate to us, what do they, they do? They bark, ruff, 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 right? They bark. They bark in different tones. You can hear it. You can hear the strain and the variation, intonation and the tone. It's human language that we do. Rah, 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 rah. Dogs, same thing. Ruff, ruff, ruff. We can tell. And those of you who know your dogs so well, you know when they're whining. If it's a real whine, if it's a fake whine, if they need to go outside, if they're trying to engage with us in a conversation, we can tell by our dog's behavior. We can tell with other people's dogs too when we apply those same principles. So, um, conversation is a super duper uh, important thing. Like it's absolutely the most gorgeous thing. What do you do with somebody? You talk to them. I was talking to somebody, uh, uh, chatting with them on, on, uh, on through text and, uh, and they're taking sign language uh, class. And it's kind of a cool thing because uh, I didn't really get too much of a conversation uh, with her, but we were just talking about sign. Uh, she was talking about sign language that she's taking in class. And I think it's phenomenal because sign language is no language, right? There's no verbalization. There's no audible hearing. There's nothing that's going on when you're actually signing. And I'm not going to try to pretend that I know how to sign, so I'm not going to. But you can see that people who are engaged are talking to each other. And if you watch two people signing to each other, it's absolutely gorgeous. I remember probably about 17 years ago, I was on the Sky Train and I saw this family on the Sky Train. And the mom and dad were both deaf or, or they couldn't talk, right? So I don't know if they were deaf or, 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 or uh, um, uh, mute, but they were not talking. They were signing to each other. And then they had two kids, one boy, one girl, uh, a, young, a younger boy and an older, like a teenage girl. And they were all signing to each other. And none of them were talking at all to each other. Even when they sat with each other, they weren't talking. The kids weren't talking, but they were signing. And if you ever get a chance, YouTube it people who sign signing to each other or or just ever if you ever have the the honor to watch two people signing to each other it's absolutely gorgeous the communication that happens just the, the body the whole connection it's primal it's like watching animals communicate with each other it's that quick that instant it, it's that beautiful and that brilliant and it uses a different part of your brain to connect but it's absolutely gorgeous and albeit being a disability, but at the same time, this intuition and the, the, the power of observation that they have is absolutely phenomenal. It's unbelievable how tight and how accurate that communication is with people. And it's it just incredible. So, um, yeah, anyhow, and, and I want to say, too, I was talking to another woman today, uh, her dog um, and her husband. Um, they, they they adopted two dog. Uh, they adopted one dog from uh, from a, a local shelter and uh, a local city shelter here, uh, and then they have their own dog as well. One's four and a half, and the other one is three. Estimated that's the one that they adopted as well. And it's incredible. I was talking to her, and she's talking about her dog, and she's talking talking, and she was saying something about uh, one of her two dogs were kind of uh, the new dog was sort of kind of being a bit belligerent to the 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 the, the, 
their own dog, right? The, 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 the senior dog, right? Who's only four and a half years of age. And I talk about seniority and the, the new dog was being belligerent and so forth like that. And there were certain things that were going on. And one of the things that this woman said was that, um, I think it's because of such and such and such. And I went, you know what? That's your intuition. She was, she, she was saying what I was going to say. That was her intuition. And the cool thing was because she, she had heard about me from a, a doggy daycare um, uh, uh, operator, owner, uh, Gus's playground, doggy playground. Um, they said to contact me, and then she looked me up and checked out my stuff. And so what was nice about it was because I have uh, somewhat a small but established body of work there, she was able to watch and reference some of the stuff and see what was about me so that when I was talking to her, I wasn't trying to fight a hill and say, well, this is what I do and this is how I do it and explain it. She already had an idea. So it was great. So we talked about it and she felt free, more free to talk about how it is because she knew that I have that same love and affinity and attraction of respect for dogs. And so she was talking about her doing this and this. And I said, that's your intuition. It's, and, and in fact, our conversation uh, flowed where she did a lot more talking than I did, which is not normal. If those of you who know me, I usually end up talking because I have to tell people what's going on and all that. And she was talking and a lot of the stuff she was talking about was a nice flow. And it was this really connected to what she thought was going on with her dogs. And even when she didn't know what was going on with her dogs, she didn't become extraneous with her speculation. On point, relative to what it was, cognizant, just beautiful intuition. So it was really great to, to be able to, to talk to her about that. Um, but it's conversation, right? And, you know, and I did tell her about seniority with her dogs, which is one of those things that um, uh, will help her in her case. Uh, so, you know, the thing is you want to maintain uh, the contextual language relative to the rudimentary mind of dogs. Because dogs are primal, they have a more logic-driven process. Logic, right? You know, logic following through on things that they need to have done, not emotionally uh, 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 restricted in, in decisions, right? How many times have we thought to do something that we should do, but we didn't do it because our doubt came in and started suppressing us and said, no, you can't do this. This is horrible. You, you're not supposed to do this. It's, it's, it's a bad it's a bad, you're gonna, it's gonna be wrong, don't do it, or, or you shouldn't do it. And then the next day you find out you should have done it because it would have been awesome. And you're like, ah, oh, my intuition, I should have trusted my intuition. Um, so with the dogs, they're processing on just that logic drive of things. They're just processing on it. And their emotional drive has somewhat of an influence. And the dogs that are not dysfunctional, not dysfunctional, have the ability to process quicker. Dogs that are dysfunctional, they're not able to process as quick because they're stuck by the deeper ends of their emotionality, their fear. It's pure fear in that sense of it. It's primal fear. They're not able to get past it. But when we work our dogs past those aspects of fear, then we can actually develop them into being much more intelligent dogs that are able to think and reason, which is one of the things I talk about here in my, in my, uh, my post here. Um, oh, actually, I should uh, continue on here uh, about the, the things. Sammy uh, Bertini says, oh, no, poor little girl. And, and Sammy, thank you for sharing my YouTube channel. Um, I'm, I'm over 500 now, so I'm really happy about this. I'm halfway there. Woohoo! So I'm halfway there. And then um, let me just see here. Um, and Casey says, my weakness is cleaning off my counters. Yeah, same here. But you know what? Get yourself uh, uh, like another four months. And Archer is going to be tall enough to clean the counters off for you. So you won't have to worry about that. Uh, hi, Lindsay. Hey, um, and uh, Casey says, uh, okay, Casey says Archer's 14 weeks. Sammy says, I once had a huge male Roddy who growled at me when he had a bone when he was about a year old. I yelled no in a loud, firm voice. And he was so startled he never growled over food or treats again. And you know what the cool thing about that, Sammy, is you probably, after he dropped it, you're probably like, oh, that's cool, right on. And you didn't make a big deal of it, and you probably complimented him and made him feel good uh, that he made the right decision, that your dog thought about it. He's got the bone in his mouth. It's a high-value target, right? It is that huge, huge thing. It's raw meat. It's part of an animal. And what do they do? They hunt animals, and they kill them, and they dismember them, and they eat them. That's the ultimate, ultimate drive for the dog when it comes to sustenance. That's all they can, how do you survive? They kill. That's all they can do. And so for him to drop that 
with such a high value target meant that you present yourself in that conversation, that conduct with your dog in a way that he understood that you respected his decision. And then what did you do? By that passively, you encouraged him to think again. You encouraged him to make smart decisions. You encouraged your dog. You helped your dog think. So that's one of those cool things about it. Uh, Casey poop my pants every time I drop something and he goes for it. Though the vet said he is in the 99th percentile of his age. So basically, Archer is a dragon. Um, I'm fluent in ASL. Oh, right on. Uh, uh, ASL, American Sign Language. Uh, because I am hard of hearing and Archer knows six commands that our kids are able to accurately sign with no words. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. Isn't it cool? And, and when I, I used to teach dogs how to... Um, uh, uh, move with sign language, right? I used to do commands, but I didn't, like, I didn't follow any, like, what am I supposed to do? So basically, I would just, you know, stop is for stay, and then this would be uh, to, to come, right? To recall, release, well, and for release or anything affirmative, any release, any affirmative, anything at all for an excellent execution of, an, uh, of a command, I always did this, which is, I said this the other day, and now that the computer is way better, I can pick this up, I, I do this in a low-end tail wag, not like this, this way. And even if you think about it, when we do it this way, right? When we do this to somebody, we're like, not, 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 nah, you shouldn't do that. What did Bruce Lee do? <laughs> right, Bruce Lee. Uh, you know, it's pretty cool. Anyways, actually, I got a text today from my former uh, uh, Sifu, Shifu, uh, Sifu, S-I-F-U, uh, teacher who taught me Wing Chun martial arts, which is the same martial arts that made Bruce Lee famous. And uh, uh, Sifu Fred Kwok uh, is a very well-known uh, Wing Chun practitioner. And when he opened up his studio back in the 80s, he actually had the Chinese consular uh, rep here um, to open up the location because uh, uh, Sifu Fred had a lot of connections on both sides of the law. He was a, a very uh, influential gentleman who would beat up gangs of people. The stories I've heard about him is just brutal. He, 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 <laughs> Sifu Fred uh, Kwok, um, and he teaches here in Vancouver, actually, for you guys. Anybody's looking for uh, a phenomenal guy. Uh, I've seen him. Uh, he's had a couple of guys from hockey farm teams, enforcers, and he just throws them around. And he's only like five foot four, five foot five, and he throws these 250, 300 pound guys around like they're sticks. And he's not hitting them, he's blocking them, and he's doing all this stuff. And they're just like, how did you do that? And there, it's so cool to see these warrior guys, hockey players, having respect for somebody on an equal footing. It just it was absolutely amazing. But um, anyhow, um, Bruce Lee did this, right? And other people do that. Like, no, 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 right? And if you look at the tail wag on the top for a dog, and I've talked about I know how dogs process and I know what their tail behavior means. It's a cognitive consciously rooted behavior when their tail is wagging upwards. And I'll get into that more detail once I start creating podcasts, series, episodics. So I do it this way, and, and this way as well. You've seen dogs with the tail lower down, and it's wagging sometimes. And you see that people say uh, when a dog's got the tail down between their legs, fear and so forth like that. It's a subconscious, but it's a somewhat conscious-based relational aspect of their perspective. It's also how the dog is processing the environment. Lincoln, stop. Thank you. Lincoln, come. Oh, see, so that's Lincoln barking. And what did I say? Lincoln, stop. Two words, right? And Lincoln understands. And Lincoln hears me. Lincoln! Lincoln's trying to get the Minky, leave him alone. Minky's blocking him because Minky knows that Lincoln's coming over for affection. Yes, Minky. Hi, Minky. Hello, Lincoln. Minky's right down here. Um, okay, so uh, what else? Uh, you know, you know uh, Casey, uh, Archer, Archer's not in the 99th percentile of things, and it's frustrating because here's the thing is, how does a dog get to be 99th percentile? How does a dog get to be way up there? Because the, the current level of experience out there kills dogs like that. So, of course, those dogs that get killed at the – hi, Lincoln. Here's Lincoln. There's Link. Hi, Lincoln. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. <laughs> right? So, you know, you have the bite level scale, the uh, APDT's bite level scale association of professional dog trainers. Wah, wah. And uh, – <laughs> They talk about Dr. Ian Dunbar, who's been doing it for 30 million years now, and he has a scale. And his scale is bite level five, which is to bite somebody and not break the skin, basically. Bite level six, uh, bite, sorry, bite level four is to bite somebody but not break the skin, right? That kind of basic thing. Bite level five is when they 
bite, the dog bites a person or an animal and causes the skin to, to bleed, right? To peel back a bit, lacerations, right? The, the, the bite into the flesh. And bite level six is when the person or do- other animal is killed by the dog. So when a dog kills somebody, a human, or they kill another animal, then they call that bite level six. And then they say the dog can't be helped and all that stuff. And so what ends up happening is those bite level six dogs, because they can't be helped without food motivation, they get killed. And then what happens to those bite level six dogs? They get all killed. They all, they're all killed. They're all mercilessly killed because they're under behavioral euthanasia, that silly, 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 incorrect scapegoat statement. Then those bite level five dogs become bite level six dogs in the sense of danger. Not in the sense of action, of recorded action, but in the sense of danger. Oh, well, that dog's going to be a bite level six dog because he's blah, 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 blah. And what ends up happening is academia out there is killing 40% of those dogs. They're killing the dogs above bite level five, actually, bite level six. But they're killing the bite level five dogs up. Word. So basically, the dogs that are bite level five, six, and in my scale, seven, eight, nine, and ten, and, and Tonka Walter is a, a bite level, a V level ten dog. All those dogs that are all killed off, they disappear, and all those level four and level five dogs, they step up and they get graduated automatically. Because what happens is people go, well, then that's the horrible. I've never seen a dog this bad before. Well, yeah, because all the other dogs have been killed by you guys in your profession. The vets don't know all this stuff because all these vets are just given papers from their colleges. The college says, oh, you know, here's a paper. Here's what we've got this information on. According to the APDT, this dog can't be helped. This is the kind of scale that they have, yada, yada, yada. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. But it's not the vet's fault because they're limited and they have to follow their ethics of what's set by their college and they have to do that and they have to give the recommendation to cover themselves uh, legally as well. So unfortunately, Casey, that's what happens. Uh, The dogs that I deal with, they are a V10 level. These are dogs that will, not if, not might, but will kill 99.9% of the trainers and behaviors out there. How do I know that? Because Tonka got turned down by every single one. How do I know that? Because Nero got turned down by every single one as well. Nero was a dog, a great Dane that I, uh, adopted. He was, um, uh, he was caged breeding, uh, he, uh, prong collared outside, lived outside for three years as well. He grabbed an, a, a 250 pound woman from his foster's couch in Alabama, yanked her onto the floor and inflicted wounds so serious it caused 67 stitches to repair. Uh, he would attempt to drag prospective male adopters over the fence at the fosters in Alabama to bring him into his yard so he could kill them. He once grabbed me by the top of my head. Actually, my hand's not even big enough. He actually grabbed me by the top of my head, hitting both temples at the same time, causing them to bleed afterwards. And, and like, that's a huge head. Like, I have a seven and three quarter inch head. And so, anyhow, um, and I have bigger hands, too, than Donald Trump. So, anyway, so he went and, and grabbed me by the top of the head and let me go, just to let me know that he could kill me if he wanted to. He could have shook and he could have went and did the pre- predatorial aspect and, and broken my neck but he didn't and it was very very lucky for me that day um so i do understand casey how you feel about being afraid and um okay so i'm just gonna go on because i don't want to run out of time because it's almost 10 o'clock here uh pst time uh, yeah pst time um sammy says i knew a deaf american bulldog who was taught si- signals for basic commands he loved to put his head by my neck when i talked to him and feel the vibrations right isn't that awesome right I, like i said dogs love to be touched dogs love to be hugged when Tonka first got here, I couldn't even touch him. One time I went and touched his collar. Same with Nero. Oh, yeah, I should say, too, Nero is a super dangerous dog, right? Like Save Rocky, the Great Dane Rescue and Rehab Charity, largest Great Dane Rescue in North America. Nobody would take Nero at all. No trainer, no behaviors, just like it was with Tonka. Nero was 10 years, four months of age when he arrived here at my place. An old, old, old Great Dane an old dog, a senior dog, people already say, you can't train an old dog new tricks. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can train an old dog new tricks. And then they say, well, you know, old senior dog, a, the dangerous dog already tried to kill uh, this woman and then tried to kill prospective adopters. You can't down train a dog like that. It took me one month, literally one month before Nero was hanging out with me. It took me nine, ten months 
before I could actually take a raw beef bone away from Nero. So Casey, this can happen over time. Take a raw beef bone from Nero while he's actually chewing on it and take it away and I could have my face beside him. Now, nobody try to do that. This is what I do. If you try to do that with your dog or a strange dog, you will most likely be attacked and viciously uh, uh, bitten. So that's my disclaimer. Do not do what I'm talking about. I'm a professional and I have a very intense dedication to saving dogs. So um, all these dogs can be helped, every single dog. So the bite level five, bite level six dogs, to me, they are literally average dogs. These are median, M-E-D-I-A-N, median dogs for me. These are average dogs. They're not scary. And here's the other thing is, I've never turned down a dog, no matter how big, no matter how dangerous they are, does not matter. I have a zero turn down rate. I have a zero kill rate. I have a zero all that stuff. When we talk about the APDT and the academia part of it, their problem is because they're such in a juvenile stage of their research into dogs and their fear of dogs as well causes them to not be able to have any great inroads into dog psychology. On my end, I just jumped into it. And because I jumped into it and I'm working with the worst of the worst type of dogs, that's what the Vancouver Sun article said about me, working with the worst of the worst dogs means by working at that level, every other dog is super simple for me. Super simple. And then I teach families how to do it themselves and how to notice those things. Um, okay, Sammy, that's, uh, oh, yeah, oh, you guys talking to each other. Um, uh, Lindsay says, Kingston is progressing quite nicely and hasn't shown any type of reaction to Kaylee in eight days. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. He has become accustomed to her glasses, seems to be fo less focused. Uh, let's focus on her and starting to show affection on his terms. Every member of my family is actively in all involved in his rehabilitation process. And this is great. Lindsay, um, Lindsay was set up uh, in a group PM with me from a Great Dane group. Um, um, and so uh, the admins on that Great Dane group, uh, Marilyn and I think Pete Brown, I, I don't remember the name exactly. I'm so sorry, you guys. Um, they set up a group PM, I think about three and a half weeks now, Lindsay. Uh, to talk about your great Dane, who you were ready to surrender because he was trying to attack your daughter, who's I think eight years or 13 years, Minky, stop it, please, eight, eight or 13 years of age. And, and she had gotten new glasses and, and he was just off the, off the hook on everything. And he was trying to attack your, his, his sister, right? His human sister, your daughter, he's trying to attack her. He's being all these other kinds of things. And then we started working at things. And I just said to you, keep it simple. Super duper simple, right? If you don't know, go back to step one. Start again. Nothing wrong with starting again if you feel anxious. Nothing wrong with resetting yourself. Not just your dog, but resetting yourself. Because when you reset yourself and you go back to step one, doesn't matter if it's my training, vid dog training, VID, vid dog training, or it's somebody else's training. If all else fails, go back to step one with your training, no matter who you learned it from. Go back to step one because then you reestablish those groundworks again. You refresh your mind. You reinforce and you refresh your dog's mind as well that they understand the basic technique because that basic techniques, that step one, that reset is what they learned their first step to begin with. So you go back to it. Same thing like humans as well. I do it. I do it with my dogs all the time. I reset them. Go back to step one. Uh, so Lindsay says, Kings, uh, um, okay, so sorry, read that. Uh, hi, Nancy. Uh, and then Lindsay says again, both of my Great Danes know and respond appropriately to signs as well. I'm not uh, fluent in ASL, but having uh, have shown and taught them sit, stay down, and wait. It's amazing. They're in so intelligent. You know what? Uh, everybody out there watching, everybody, dogs are incredibly brilliant. They will not just willingly defend us with their own life, but they pay attention to everything that we're doing. They're learning our language. Think about this. Our dogs are learning how we talk. Our dogs are learning how we react. And how, what are we doing? We're like, I don't know what the dog's saying. He's being stupid. He's, make, he's barking. He's making goofy noises. We don't, the, 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 academia doesn't even know what's going on with dogs and the way they talk. And they, that's why I say, listen to the way the dogs are talking. You can hear the tone and the voice. And when they growl, roo, 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 that's conversation that they're having. That's how smart our dogs are. They've developed this conversation with us. 
They're listening to us. They're responding to us. And what do we do? We're like, I don't know. I let my dog out to go pee and he came back in. Uh, why? My dog's dumb. No, you're right. Actually, I talk about that in another vlog is why does the dog go outside and come back in? It's because we give them behavior, our own behavioral uh, 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 signs that we're going to go outside and join them. And so our dog's like, oh, we're going outside. And they're like, wait, my, my, my dad's still inside. I'm coming back inside. And then we're like, oh, no, let's go outside. And then they go outside. And they're like, wait a minute. You didn't come back out again. You tricked me, you son of a beep. So what ends up happening is it's our behavior, but our dog's interpreting it. So, yes, dogs are incredibly smart. Absolutely. And if, if here's the thing is dogs are being killed, 6 million of them behavioral-wise. There's almost 100 million dogs in North America, 99.4 million in 19. Uh, sorry, in 2007, uh, 2018, 2018, 99.4 million dogs, 89 million in the United States, about 9.5, 9.6 million in Canada. Cats outnumber dogs by one to 2% on that margin. Out of those 90, uh, 89 million dogs in the United States, almost 61 million dogs, almost, I'm sorry, almost uh, uh, those 90 million dogs live in 61 million homes in the United States and Canada, it's about the same percentage, right? Blah, blah, blah. Anyhow. So, um, the dogs that are being killed, a 6% kill rate, 6 million dogs. That's a lot of dogs. And it's a tragic event for those of us who have had to kill our dog, right? We, we, you know, who, and it's worse when you have somebody out there who is saying, I, I sound like Christopher Walken. You have, anyway, um, when you have, these people out there who are professionals that you're paying 100, 200, 300, 400 dollars an hour, and they're telling you your dog has behavioral euthanasia, they have behavioral issues, and they're reactive and aggressive and dangerous. And so we recommend behavioral euthanasia. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, really, you people? Like, it's like being in a room full of children sometimes because it doesn't need to happen. This behavioral euthanasia is another label for an aptitude misunderstanding and juvenile understanding of dogs. So there's a mean little thing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, Casey, I'm so happy that people are teaching dogs to sign. I, I, I love this. I love you guys for doing this. Lindsay, uh, Sammy, I mean, it's great. Uh, I love Lincoln. He's gorgeous. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, Sammy, a male lady told me once that she knew my barking Dane wouldn't bite her because her tail was wagging. Ha ha, I've known dogs that bite while their tail is wagging. That's true. Uh, very true. So when a dog is wagging their tail at the top and all that stuff, depending on the speed, depending on their motion, because sometimes they go like this and then they go like this and then they go like that or else they go like this and they go like this only on one side as well. It's all indicative of cognitive processing. And on top of that, it can be subterfuge as well. Your dog is smart enough to portray confidence and lack of threat, but in actual fact, ready to bite some serious butt. It's subterfuge as well. The, the, up at the top, when the dog's tail is on the bottom, when the dog is swooshing in a figure eight, I've talked about that before, or, or in a ribbon, or on a, just one angle and all that stuff, frustration type of behavior. It's the dog's tail behavior, not tail set. You've heard that phrase before. For those of you who've hired trainers, they've called the dog's tail set. That's 100% wrong word. And that's why I'm saying they don't know what they're talking about. They're using wrong words. A set tail set. The dog is doing like this. That's not a tail set. That's a tail behavior. It's a behavior. That's a behavior. That's not a set. A set is a set of dishes, man. It's a set of cutlery. It's a set, place setting. It's a fixed thing. It's like a, uh, what, a prefix menu? I'm probably murdering that word, that, that, that language too, but it's a set. So what ends up happening is they're misinterpreting things, blah, blah. Okay, so I'm going to go on. Uh, so the tail wagging, um, my dog would eat my face. Uh, Kaylee is 10. Yes, that's correct. Uh, Lindsay says, has anyone seen the article from the speech pathologist taught a dog to speak? Oh, oh yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, 20 specific words that are respond. He can pot the words and speak to his owner using this board to communicate. It's absolutely fascinating. You know, Lindsay, that was, uh, I saw that on CNN. 
uh, as well as a speech pathologist out in Australia that had taught her dog how to talk things like need help outdoor, all these things. The problem with that, and she's somewhat there, right? And I talked about this in, I think, two or three vlogs beforehand. She's somewhat there, but she's not right because what she's done is she's overtrained her dog to follow through on the nuances of behavior that's going on. And the dog has already learned to hear the noises of those voices on those those little, the little, the, cause they're round ones, right? And they're all around on the, on, I think four rows of five or some, or six rows of 12. Anyways, um, it's a guy, uh, it's a girl. I mean, it's a woman that does this, the speech pathology. So we may have seen different uh, articles, but that's the thing. But what's happening is when it comes to those, those little press button things, what the problem is there is that it's an electronic voice. So when the dog presses the word for help, the, for, the word says help, and you're like, what? So it doesn't have to flow. So that dog is not going to have the understanding of human conversation. doesn't have context. It's, that dog is overtrained. But then everyone goes, oh, my gosh, she's absolutely amazing. And it is. It's absolutely amazing to see the structure of the creation of it. But unfortunately, she has her dog at 70% of proficiency in regards to being able to have reasoning skills, to have context of what her dog is asking for. So when I talk in regards to this thing, in regards to conversation, I'll get to this later on in a bit. I just want to go through all the articles here. Um, uh, Kim says, my girls have made progress now. Blossom and River and Luke. The cat as well. Awesome, Kim. I'm so happy. Um, is this the board with pictures? No, it's designed to speak the words. I think they're color-coded. I have seen that one, but I did see one where a gorilla was teaching her dog to use her word board. The article that I'm referring to is the speech pathologist in San Francisco. Okay. You know, yeah, there, there's one. Yeah, there's one. Like, you go Google CNN, and the and speech pathologist teaches her dog to, to talk, basically. Um, watch that. And you'll see what I mean. The voices are, are, are electronic, so the dog doesn't understand the emotional context, the, the flow. So the dog has a very limited envelope of understanding. So then if you have a limited envelope of understanding, you don't understand the more defi definitions of that word, how the word can be used as an idiom, 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 as an idiom, etc., etc. Wow, I am really getting back to my grade 8 English. Um, okay, so what else I wrote down here is... Um, and let's see, I'm at 51 minutes here. Okay, so uh, yeah, I teach my owners. Um, okay, so I'm going to read it through here. And I, and I apologize for taking my eyes off camera. Um, I teach my dogs and owners and their dogs how to converse, not talk, to their dog. In a real conversation without extraneous words, to maintain contextual language relative to the rudimentary mind of dogs. And that's where, as far as I got to before I went off on my tangents. Uh, scientists say dogs are like children, and they're right but they are not recognizing the dog's primal and predatory nature and how it operates at a blazing speed, right? I, I say dogs react at a tenth of a second. That's physically reacting. That's not what their mind's already reacting. And if you guys see things yourself, if you've ever seen something happen in slow motion, I feel like I'm Mike Myers, Dr. Evil, zip it, um, uh, laser beam. Um, well, I've got all these references today. I'm so happy, I love I, I, this computer. And you guys can see me. Um, I feel like Sally Field now. Okay. with the All right. I'm getting old here. Um, so um, the dog is processing at such a fast speed. And that when we see things that we see in slow motion, it's because we're processing at that speed. Our mind has gone from conscious aspects of it and has allowed our, our function, our primal functions, that, that part in the base cortex where our primal functions of survival happen is happening. It takes over. And that's what our dog does. How the dog processes a field of vision, everything in that peripheral aspect of anticipatory and rhetorical and redundancy of what happens when a dog processes their field of vision, which also works in line with how dogs process time through, uh, through abstract memory. So we talk about abstract memory, how a dog processes time through slideshow type of behavior. I'll get that into, into my podcast details. I cannot wait. I'm so scared of doing the podcast because I'm going to be doing it without anyone feedback. And I'll be like, I'm so scared. I just hate this stuff. I Public speaking. But anyhow, I love this as well. Um, so the dog is processing time through abstract memory as in regards to slideshow behavior and that processing of it. But when they're processing their field of vision in those slideshows, it's that aspect of redundant and rhetorical 
uh, perspective as well <laughs> as well as anticipatory behavior of the field of vision that the dog is processing. Watch Bruce Lee. Watch the way Bruce Lee talks during his conversations and interviews. Watch him. He is so slowed down on purpose when he's talking. We watch his mind, and that you will see is a human predator. Look at Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson is a human predator. Gorgeous. And even other people, you've seen people who, who have killed people, who have done really evil things. Those people aren't, aren't the same vein of that because the human predator, such as Bruce Lee uh, or Mike Tyson, they're able to exist, exist and function emotionally and logically, whereas you have the other ones who are just somewhat bent out of that shape. But if you still watch the way these people talk and they observe, it's absolutely gorgeous. There's a... Uh, there's this one thing I was watching on CNN, um, which was, uh, oh, I, actually, no, 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 sorry. You know what? It's it's actually in my Facebook post where I did about that uh, Eduardo guy, and I'm, I'm not going to pronounce his last name because I can't, but he's the one who's walking around all of Mexico around the outside of the border, and he's already walked almost 14,000 kilometers in the last six years, and he pushes a cart with all these other dogs, and he rescues dogs, and he... He finds homes for them and all that stuff. And he talks about the cruelty of humans to these dogs that he picks up. Some are missing legs and other parts. Some are extremely scared. They're abandoned and they're on the, the guy's walking, you know, say 150 kilometers between or, you know, 90 miles between towns. He'll find a dog that's been dropped off and it's almost dead. And he'll, he'll recover that dog and help bring them back to life. And if he can't do it himself, he's got the, all the medications, all that. If he can't do the, the bigger stuff, then he brings a dog to the vet and then he waits for that dog to heal. So he'll stay in that town for several days, if not weeks, waiting for that one dog to heal. Once the dog is healthy enough, he'll try to find a home there. If he can't find a real home, then he'll take that dog and take him with him to the next place. He'll push the dog in a cart it's just what this guy does is an amazing, brave thing because we know what the cartels, uh, the drug cartels are like down there in Mexico. The fact that he's still alive is absolutely amazing and brilliant. And it's just absolutely gorgeous humanity. There is a part there, and I, and I, I put the timestamp um, in my, my post where there's a part where he's talking about dogs. And there's a look in his face as he makes a, a, a subconscious and conscious shift in the way he says, and if you watch that moment in time, that instant in time, you will see an entire volume spoken in that. It's, it's like sign language. It's conversation, but you see that happening. So it's absolutely brilliant and absolutely guard sharks with laser beams. Um, Lindsay says, that makes sense, James. With no tone or pitch, it could be misconstrued construed easily yeah it can be misconstrued because the dog doesn't understand the fluctuations in the context same thing when if i you know we talk about the word your 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 and your if i don't pronounce it or i don't put it in context you don't know what i'm talking about and that's the three yours that everyone hates right i hate it when you right and so that's the thing um uh, oh he's a pure oh okay i don't know what that is casey though pure oh, but it, i mean phenomenal gorgeous soul yeah, the kindness in his eyes is absolutely right. And sharks with laser beams. And you know what? Be careful, Casey, because if Archer hears you say that, he might be asking for some laser beams. And then try getting that food away from him. You're like, hey, what happened to my fingers? <laughs> Anyways, would have been a better joke if I thought about it sooner. All right, so I'm um, going to go on here. Um, so dogs are, are, are right. The predatory, they operate at a blazing speed. Even though they react physically at a tenth of a second, they're actually reacting even faster than that. And they're processing so quick. It's so gorgeous. When you watch your dogs and you watch them, you say something to them with just enough words, watch the way they process it. And then they'll, they'll watch you and then they'll blink. And they, if they do a full blink or they do a partial blink, if they do a quick blink, it's all these little things that indicate the way the dog's processing your input. That's how smart they are. And then people are like, why is the dog blinking? Because uh, I blinked. No, not because you blinked. It's because your dog's actually thinking. It's, it's just gorgeous what you can see. And Lincoln's now taking apart a toy and eating the plastic wheezy thing. Thank goodness. Uh, he, he didn't make the noise. Um, so, um, okay. So, thing is, I talked to the dogs in their established voice key. So, I talk about the voice key of a dog, which is the melody of the dog. 
that tone that that dog loves to listen to, that sound of our voice or sound in that thread, or that envelope that the dog enjoys listening to, that they always hear it. Like I said, is we can hear our parents' voice right away when we talk, and then we're like, oh my gosh, that's my mom talking again, right? You know, my mom's passed away, but if I, I was like, oh my gosh, that'd be right, amazing. So we can hear the familiarity. We, we become accustomed to it. Our dogs become accustomed to it because they hear us talking every single minute of the day in regular conversation with people in the house, people on the phone. They hear it. So they hear our tone. They know what's normal. They know what's not normal in our tone. That's why when we're on the phone and we're animated, sometimes our dog's like, woohoo, and they come up just like kids. They come up to us. But why does our dog come up to us? All right, because that's another reason. Uh, it's an, it, 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 it is an aspect that your dog thinks something is happening, that there's a, an adventure ahead, so to speak. Um, okay, so this all combined creates a highly intellectualized connection. I teach owners how to trust their primal intuition, their own predator, like I said there, to parent their dog like a human surrogate. And that's what we need to look at. We're taking care of our dogs as we're human, but we're their surrogate. It's absolutely impossible for us to ever have a dog baby. Somebody just farted. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it was really bad sounding. Um, but we're, we're processing what's going on um, uh, with our dogs as in we're a human with an animal. Cross-species cohabitation, an amazing honor for us to be able to have an animal like that. Same with cats. But with the dogs, they're much more participatory or most, well, more dogs than cats are participatory in, in the family structure, right? Their ventures are doing stuff and everything like that. So uh, they pick it all that up. Um, and what else did I say here? Um, okay. My photo phone is dead. Good night, people. Oh, okay. Sorry, Casey. Um, hopefully you get to see it in, um, uh, the next day uh, or, or whatever, um, on YouTube or something. Um, sorry. Um, okay. So what I do too is, uh, I say, uh, I wrote down here, I call my dogs in order of seniority, which I talked about before I call. And so what happened this one day, um, which is really kind of cool, um, I let my dogs out in seniority to go to the bathroom, to go come inside, to go outside, whatever it is. They're always in seniority. If I have to take them for a walk, then it has to be mixed up a bit because it just has to be because, because of certain uh, dysfunctions certain dogs have. But when I go to let them out to go to the bathroom, what I'll do is I'll call them in order. And so, for example, Minky is before William. Minky showed up before William, right? There, you know, there's Sammy. I mean, well, there's Nero. Uh, Sammy, Walter, Lincoln, Minky, William, um, uh, Anthony, uh, you know, so what ends up happening, so Minky is before William, and what happens is I've always worked with them where I will call them one at a time, and, you know, they're always like, ah, we want to be right there, they're all crowding, and so I've, they've learned over, you know, a few weeks that it's in order, so then I'll call Minky, so I'll say to Minky, and then once Minky passes me to go outside, then I'll call William. But what happened, and I, and this is what we do. What you need to do is mix it up every once in a while with your dogs. So what happens is when Miki was coming through, and just as he, before he approached me, so instead of him being he, like here at my side, oops, sorry guys, uh, instead of him being here at my side, by the time he passes me, when I call William's name out, he wasn't, he was still approaching me. So what I did was I said, William, and then Miki immediately stopped in his tracks. And what did, why, right? Why did Miki stop? Because he heard William's name called. Okay. But then we expand on what that reason is, why our dog did that. Why Minky stopped when I called William's name. And this has happened with Anthony. This has happened with other dogs. And I've done this with all of them. And you guys with more than one dog, you'll see the same thing. What happened was Minky thought to himself, hi, Minky. Minky thought to himself that he misheard his name because I called William's name out. He thought. He misheard it. He thought he was wrong. He made a mistake thinking his name was called because he heard William's name because normally I don't call William's name till Minky's passed me and out the door. So he heard William's name. He's like, uh-oh, and he stopped, and he thought about it, and he remained still, which meant that he was cognizant. He was sentient. He was aware. Minky, the dog, was aware that he made a mistake. Even though it wasn't a mistake in his mind, he processed it as, oops, I made a mistake. I better stop because I don't want to get in trouble. 
and he doesn't get in trouble. He just he just gets he just doesn't get through if that happens, right? If I mix it up, and I'll randomize it every once in a while. The seniority basis, I'll start to randomize it. But what happens is I stopped. If they not supposed to go, I don't let them through. Like Anthony used to just barge through everybody, and it would really upset the other dogs. <laughs> so he's the last one here. He's going to be the last one through. So I hold him back. But with Minky, the same thing. So Minky actually, hi Minky, hi Minky. Hi, Minky. So Minky actually thought he made a mistake. Hi, Minky. Up, oh, silly boy. Hello, silly boy. Hi, Minky. So Minky, see, and he hears his name, right? So what ends up happening is Minky thought he made a mistake, and he stopped. And William started coming towards as well. And so I let William go through, and I said, no, Minky, go ahead. And then Minky was, oh, okay, and he just ran through. So he realized, he thought, conscious thought. That's why when you're saying dogs are brilliant, you guys, dogs are absolutely 100% brilliant, absolutely incredibly gorgeous. And it is that part that he realized that he broke the rules. He made the mistake. He misheard. But the actual fact was he didn't. So even if he makes a mistake or he didn't make the mistake, I don't make a huge deal of it. But because he thought he made the mistake and he made the decision, conscious decision to stop. I was like, good boy, Minky. You know, no, go, Minky, go. You can go. Go, Minky. And then William went through and, and then, you know, all that stuff. Right, so this sentence, it's a dog responding to a human's language. Like I said, our dog understands what we're doing while we humans are like, uh, tail set? Huh? Right? So this is what I'm saying. Our dogs are so much more brilliant and we're not giving them that, that, um, that honor. Um, okay, so the dog's responding, uh, all right. And it, yeah, and it shows how tightly bonded they are to us because they're paying attention. They know what we're doing. They're hearing our language. If our dog barks at us, we're like, what? What do you want? What do you want? Is Jimmy in the well? Is Jimmy in the well? Come on, lassie. Okay, so that's for you guys. Um, all right, so uh, then what else do I talk about? And then here's another thing why conversation is so important. When I work with my dogs, I never whistle to them. I never use any disingenuous language. I never use words that are not normal in daily human conversation. I always use language. I, I, and I have caught myself around, ah, like that because they're about to do something. But I, oh, Lincoln, there's no, oh, it's just Minky. So I don't try to force any kind of disingenuous language because I want my dogs to understand how I'm talking. If I'm talking normally like this, I'm going to talk normally like this on the phone. If I'm talking like that to my friends or someone visiting here or UPS driver, I'm going to talk like this no matter what. I'm going to talk normal. And my dog's going to hear normal conversation. I'm not going to talk to him with a UPS driver. Hey, thanks a lot for the delivery. And then talk to one of my dogs. Oh, you're such a cute little boy. Oh, you're such a good puppy. Because they're like, dude, what are you talking? To? You just talked to a human being like this. And now you're talking to me like I'm dumb and stupid and I'm a toy. Or else I could talk to the UPS driver. Hi, thank you so much for the package. Would you like to come in for some coffee? Right? You want a treat? Right, that kind of stuff. So it's that part. We want to have a regular conversation. Our dog hears regular conversation. We talk to our dog regular conversation. They understand regular conversation. So what ended up happening is I was downtown that day, and um, I had brought uh, three of my Danes with me. And their heads are sticking out. There's 450 pounds of dog. And they're all out there, and they're all looking out there. And we're downtown. Traffic is stop and go as usual down there with the lights. And a guy in a car starts whistling over at my dogs. Like, well, whatever. I can, I'm not even going to whistle because I don't want to wreck the, make you guys go on the mic. And so he's whistling. And, and none of my dogs are paying attention to him at all. They're just like looking around, looking around. Like, they don't care. One of them, you know, they're like, who cares? And then a kid calls out, goes, hi, hi, doggies. And they all look. They didn't look because they thought the kid was bringing them a treat because I don't do that. I don't treat train my dogs. I give them snacks. Unless I want to work with them with recall or something like that, which is, again, treats are great for, for uh, uh, expediting compliance when it comes to trick training, obedience, et cetera. But when it comes to... Uh, dysfunctions, which all my dogs come from dysfunctional background, I talk normal. And I talk normal even when I do give them treats or a snack. When I train them on other aspects, I'm always talking normally to them. And I do the passive training, in motion training, right, and, and all that part of it. So I talk to them in normal tones of voice. So what ended up happening is the kids, even though it's a little bit high pitch, say the name, the dogs look at the child. And the guy's just like, oh, that's weird. Like he's scratching his head basically like, what? Why are they, what? What? What's going on? 
oh, it must like kids. No, my dogs don't know kids, right? I mean, they're like, okay, kid, just leave me alone, right? Um, but my, so they're responding to the conversation. They're responding to somebody calling them. Same thing if we're down the street, right? We hear somebody whistling. We don't usually look because we're like, they're whistling for a taxi or they're whistling for somebody. It's not for us. It doesn't mean anything to us, right? Because it's not relevant. But if somebody goes, hey, then we're like, what? Are they calling me? What? Right? Human conversation, regular conversation. So that's one thing I, I want to kind of uh, get on to that is use regular conversation. Talk to your dogs. Have a great conversation. Say hi. How's it going? All that. Use just enough words that you need to use. Don't use too many. Don't over talk. Don't, don't feel nervous and over talk. That's what we do a lot. And I find it myself, I'm like, uh, keep repeating myself like that. I talk about ruining recall by repeating the same come here, come here, come here phrase. Just talk normally to your dogs. Don't over, uh, don't, don't, you know, uh, oh boy, everybody is ripping toys apart today. And Minky is, hi Minky. Minky. Um, so just regular conversation. Use just enough words. Just like it is when you are meeting somebody for the first time. You want to just have enough words with them. You don't want to be like over talking. You, you don't want to do TMI, too much information. You just want to talk enough so that they go, oh, there's an interest in it. That's what we want to do with our dogs. We want to have the conversation so that they're still interested in what we're saying and they're still paying attention to what we're saying, which is why sign language and hand signal commands are so excellent. It all makes sense. It's all human behavior. We see two wolves running down the forest and they're hunting something and one wolf just kind of looks at the other one and the other one looks back and they keep going and then one goes off. Communication, brilliance. They're, they're identifying through their field of vision their, the, the trajectory of the other dog and the behavior and they're watching the nuance and, the, and, the, um, and, and they reconcile the way they look at each other so they have an understanding. Absolutely gorgeous, absolutely brilliant. And then... Um, Let's see what else is there. Yeah. So, and then at the end of the uh, end of the day, I want to say about have you ever had a relationship where the other person that you knew in your life, in your life, you had a relationship with somebody, and they were constantly contacting you and texting you and phoning you, and you want to go do something, and they're like, "Oh, I'll come with you," and then they you want to go hang out with your friends, and they're like, "Oh, I'll come with you," and you're like, mm, "Right." And what do you say about that person? Codependent. She's too codependent. He's codependent. He doesn't leave me alone. She's always calling me. Codependent. Your dog goes and follows you to the bathroom. Your dog follows you out the door. You go out the door and you leave them behind. They're at the door thinking, I want to go outside. I want to go outside with you. I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. I want to go. Your dog is codependent. Lincoln. Lincoln, stop. Lincoln, stop yelling. Lincoln. Lincoln. Thank you. So we just shift the tone from that part of urgency out of voice key three. And then I shift it downward in tone and in mannerisms using the same words. Still out of voice level, uh, voice key three. It's still the same, but it's just a different adjustment. Hi, Lincoln. Um, so, it, again, it goes back to that codependency. Again, your dog follows you everywhere. You have a boyfriend or girlfriend that follows you everywhere. It's always want to be in touch with you. Codependency. Why dogs and humans coexist, cohabitate, emotional isomorphism. We're sharing emotional context together, cohabitation. Did you guys see this article before I uh, go off here? You see that article that just came out in Russia? They found a canine, a pup, a dog, a puppy that was buried are frozen in the permafrost in Russia that they estimate is 18,000 years old. 18,000 years old. It's the oldest canine that they found, which then automatically is like, and it was in a, in a domestic or, you know, civilized or whatever for that time, domesticated area where humans lived. So now they're saying, Holy cow, we just thought dogs were together for the last 10,000 years. Now it's 18,000 years. Which means if it's happening at 18,000 years, you probably can get closer to maybe 35, 40,000 years backing it up 
on that aspect where emotional isomorphism, the cohabitation of the dog with human, the cross species aspect of it started. I would, I would estimate around 35,000 years if that's happening that 10,000 years. I always thought 10,000 was too short to begin with, to be honest with you. Because you're talking about a predator living with another predator. Two predators, li- Minky, you're looking at two predators living together. Knowing the ferocity of the dog, the canine, doesn't matter at the end of the day. This human being, me and a, and, and a dog, I'm going to lose. The dog is the size of a wolf or like Tonka, 180 plus pounds, 38 inches at the withers. You know, the dog is six feet, four inches standing over, over me. I'm five foot 11. A dog that big will just kill me. I mean, he's, I've been there where he's faced off in front of me and just stood there watching me, literally 30 inches away from me. The dog will kill these cave pe- men, these caveman, cave people, whatever, Neanderthals, troglodytes, right? They will kill these people in an instant. Cohabitation. So that means that that, that that structure of it being able to be cohabitated over, over millennia is just absolutely unbelievable. And we can't wait to see where the research is going to lead us to that. But uh, anyhow, so remember, conversation is really important. We talked about the whole thing, getting it all back around in circle and all that stuff. Thank you all so much for uh, paying attention and watching out what I'm doing and seeing everything that's going on. I hope that uh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that I can see this. I have clarity, a little bit pale on that. I had the little light thing on. I had this covering, like the covering the the, the daylight uh, LED light that I that I bought. I don't know if this is any better. Uh, um, hard to tell. Now I don't look so Asian. I look more Caucasian. All right, guys. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for uh, tuning in. It's Wednesday, Friday. Um, I might be a little bit late with my vlog. I do have a session in Vancouver. Um, but I will try to, uh, to get it on time and all that stuff. Uh, enjoy yourselves. Please be kind to other people. Please, uh, tolerate somebody else for another 10, 12, 15, 20 seconds. If you're not happy with the conversations going and you're talking to them on the phone, tolerate it for 12 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, show some kindness, show, show some tolerance, be patient. That patience is what I do with my dogs and other people's dogs. I don't have a choice. I have to work at the dog's speed of processing, but also give them time to be able to go through things and the urgency to have them not be so reactive, dangerous, barking, attacking, and all that stuff is there. But be patient. And that's what I am with my dogs and other people's dogs. Just be patient. So when you're talking to somebody on the phone, give them an extra 12, 15, 20 seconds of your time and then say to them, okay, cool. You know what? Can we not talk about this anymore? And then move the conversation forward and they'll learn to understand that. And that's that respect that we have because we're so impatient. We're a technologically driven species. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night and uh, I will see you on Friday. Bye-bye.